In December 2019, China notified the World Health Organization of several cases of human respiratory illness, a disease later named COVID-19. The virus causing this disease is known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The disease spreads through small droplets that are expelled from the nose or mouth when a person with COVID-19 coughs or exhales. Therefore, standing close to someone who is infected can put you at risk. These droplets can land on your hand and be transmitted through something as simple as a handshake if afterwards you touch your eyes, nose or mouth, the so-called T-zone. The virus is known to survive on different types of surfaces, so touching these contaminated surfaces and then touching your T-zone brings a high risk of infection. What we know so far. The coronavirus is spherical in shape and its genetic material is encapsulated by different types of proteins. Some of the key structural ones are spike S protein, the most prominent feature of coronaviruses from where they get their name, then M or membrane protein, and the so-called envelope protein. Horacio Imperata para sa COVID-2019 Ama naming mapagmahal, lumalapit kami sa iyo sa aming pangangailangan upang hilinging kami ay ipagadyamo sa sakit na dulot ng COVID-2019 na kumitil ng maraming buhay at patuloy na kumakalat sa iba't ibang bayan at bansa. Hinihiling namin ang iyong biyaya sa lahat ng mga nag-aaral ng uri at pinagmula ng salot na ito. Patnubayan mo ang lahat ng dalubhasa sa medisina na tumutulong sa mga may sakit upang sila ay mapuno ng matibay na pagmamalasakit at pagdamay. Ipinapanalangin namin ang mga pamahalaan na naghahanap ng lunas at kagalingan para sa mga pinahihirapan ng sakit dulot ng salot na ito. Ipinagkakatiwala namin sa iyo ang lahat ng nagdurusa dahil sa sakit na ito. Pagalingin mo sila at bigyan ng mabuting kalusugan. Pukawin mo ang aming kalooban upang maging handa kaming tulungan ang mga may sakit at nangangailangan. Hinihiling namin ito sa pamamagitan ni Heso Kristong anak mo na nabubuhay at nagaharing kasama mo at ng Espiritu Santo, iisang Diyos, magpasawalang hanggan. Amen. Mahal na Birhen, mapagampon sa mga Kristiyano, ipanalangin mo kami. San Rafael ang Arkanghel, ipanalangin mo kami. San Roque, ipanalangin mo kami. San Lorenzo Ruiz, ipanalangin mo kami. San Pedro Kalungsod, ipanalangin mo kami. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Before we start our webinar, here are some reminders and guidelines for our virtual participants. First, please observe proper webinar and video conferencing etiquette. In addition, please change your settings to speaker view. Also, you may post your questions through the link shown in your screen. 
Alternatively, you can also post your questions through the chat box in your Zoom console. Lastly, details on how to get your e-certificates will be flashed at the end of this webinar. We expect your adherence to these guidelines. Thank you very much. The Biorisk Association of the Philippines in collaboration with the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists warmly welcomes all our virtual participants on the international webinar on essential biosafety for COVID-19. The coronavirus disease COVID-19, is an infectious disease caused by a new strain of coronavirus. This new virus and disease were unknown before the outbreak began in Wuhan, China, in December 2019. On 30 January 2020, the Philippine Department of Health reported the first case of COVID-19 in the country with a 38-year-old female Chinese national. On 7 March, the first local transmission of COVID-19 was confirmed. To date, there are more than 5.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally. In the Philippines, we have more than 15,000 confirmed cases with almost 1,000 fatalities. The laboratory is at the forefront of our collaborative efforts to contain COVID-19. This free webinar is designed to enhance the competency of laboratorians in ensuring the safety and security of their respective workplaces and institutions amid the continuing threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. This virtual event is granted by the CPD Council for Medical Technology, with two CPD units. This webinar will be moderated by the Assistant Auditor of the Biorisk Association of the Philippines, Mr. Larry J. Langaman. Indeed, biosafety is an integral component of any biocontainment facility, such as laboratory. Today, we are delivering to you a webinar on essential biosafety for COVID-19, and it is my distinct honor to be your moderator. To officially open this webinar, Please welcome the President of BIRA, Dr. Miguel Martin Moreno II. Good evening from the Philippine Islands to all our viewers all over the globe. I am Dr. Miguel Martin Moreno, founding and incumbent president of the Bioris Association of the Philippines, more known as BIRA. I welcome you all to this first BIRA PAMET International Webinar. This webinar, which is another milestone for BIRA, is made possible with, with the inspiration and cheer of BIRA's official partner, the Philippine Association of Medical Technologies, Incorporated, through its national president, Mr. Ronaldo Puno, who is also BIRA's incumbent vice president, and also through PAMET's former president, Dr. Laila Lani Florento, who is BIRAP's incumbent secretary for two terms now. This joint activity with the timely theme, Essential Biosafety for COVID-16 of Laboratorians in the Philippines in Biosafety and Biosafety Measures in COVID-19 Testing, as well as Risk Assessment and Control for COVID-19 Diagnosis. We have invited two internationally renowned speakers for this maiden webinar. Both will be properly introduced in a short while. I wish to thank in advance all of you who are here, BIRAP and PAMET members, biosafety practitioners, scientists, and those representing the International Federation of Biosafety Associations and the Asia-Pacific Biosafety Association for giving us your precious time. On behalf of BIRAP officers, the organizers, and this webinar, and our partner, PAMET, thank you for simply being here. And I wish you all a fruitful webinar. This will be the first of a series for BIRAP. As the saying goes, break a leg, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for that warm welcome and comprehensive information on what brought this webinar to life. Today, we are also joined by another equally important person. We will be hearing a short message from the face and the voice of Filipino medtechs, ladies and gentlemen, Ronaldo Puno, the national president of PAMI. 
Good evening to all our colleagues and by your safety enthusiasts in the Philippines. And good morning and good afternoon to those who are in other parts of the world. Welcome to the very first joint VRAP Summit International webinar, webinar on essential biosafety in COVID-19. Today, we are joined by more than 1,000 participants, both in our official platform and FB page. But due to heavy influx of interested participants, we apologize that many were not able to register. Thank you very much for the overwhelming support. We assure you that we have lined up many other webinars in the coming weeks and months, and these will also carry some CPD units. This is our way of assisting our professionals to be able to comply with the CPD requirements at the comfort of their homes. On behalf of PAMET, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to our esteemed speakers from Canada and Singapore for unselfishly, agree for selfishly, unselfishly agreeing to, to share their expertise related to biosafety and bio-risk assessment as the world continues to fight COVID-19 and they will be properly introduced later. As we have experienced in the past months, pande this pandemic change and continuously changing our lives. And this is unprecedented in the world history and everyone was caught by surprise. It is, however, a very important opportunity for healthcare professionals, especially for medical technologists, to be at the forefront and share our knowledge and expertise in handling various situations. We feel that it is high time to be better equipped so that all the aspects of body safety and assessment will be handled by our medical technologies. And we are hoping that this session will provide meaningful information that can help us fight our unseen enemies, that is COVID-19. So enjoy listening and enjoy learning. Again, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ronnie, for yet another motivating message. We will keep that in mind. And now, for our first learning session, I am honored to introduce our resource person. Our first speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Honors Microbiology from University of Guelph and Master of Science in Microbiology from University of Ottawa. She has several certification specialized related to her current work from different countries. Her professional designations and memberships include Accredited Facility Facilitator, Singapore Ministry of Health, IFBA Professional Certification for Biocontainment Facility Design, Operations and Maintenance, IFBA Professional Certification Bio-Risk Management, a registered microbiologist and registered biosafety professional, a member of WHO Stop TB Partnership, GLI roster of TB Biosafety Consultants also a member of security under the government of Canada. Currently, she is the director of MCE Consulting, providing guidance on development of biosafety policy, guidelines, and regulatory framework to national human animal health authorities responsible for implementing programs, design, commissioning, and certification of BSL-2, 3, and 4 laboratories to develop and deliver bio-risk management programs, SOPs, and biosafety manuals for BSL-2, 3, 4 labs and animal facilities worldwide, and also to develop and deliver trainings and workshops worldwide. She is the current executive director of IFBA that works in partnership with several international agencies. She acts as ISO liaison organization regarding ISO 35001. This organization also guide the Biocontainment Engineering Working Group, implement international professional certification program for bio-risk management and biocontainment engineers. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our first speaker, Maureen Ellis. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very thankful and grateful to BRAP and Palmet for hosting this important seminar.
I'd also like to thank all of the participants this evening for taking the time to join us while we speak to you about the importance of biosafety, biosecurity, and the response to COVID-19. We are all part of the global community that has been called to action in this global fight against COVID-19. It's a community working together, and we know that without adequate biosafety and biosecurity practices, equipment, laboratory infrastructure, our efforts to control and contain this pandemic could be seriously impacted. In carrying out our work around the world with respect to biosafety and biosecurity, we've learned that successful and sustainable approaches are risk-based and locally driven at the national level in each of your countries, including in the Philippines. The World Health Organization has prepared comprehensive guidelines related to coronavirus disease and how to safely and securely handle this infectious agent in your laboratories. This material has been adapted into national requirements in many countries around the world, including in the Philippines, based on your local conditions, the risks that are presented in your facilities specific to how you are handling this agent in laboratories across your country. This information is presented in RITM's Bio-Risk Management's Interim Biosafety Guidelines for Laboratories Handling and Testing SARS-CoV. I would recommend that you consult both of these documents very carefully and ensure that you are familiar with the contents of the requirements specifically as presented for the Philippines. The World Health Organization's biosafety guidance materials follows a risk-based approach. You may be familiar with their previous approach as outlined in their laboratory biosafety manual, which consisted of four different risk groups for microorganisms and their respective biosafety levels of laboratories, one through four. This approach has been amended in their impending fourth edition laboratory biosafety manual, whereby core requirements specific for every laboratory are outlined and the core requirements are supplemented with heightened control measures based on your individual site specific and activity specific risk assessment. Dr. Viji will be going into more details on how to conduct a risk assessment in the next presentation, but included within the World Health Organization's Biosafety Guidance for COVID-19, you will find a template and the steps to be followed in carrying out your risk assessment, how to gather the information specific to your laboratories, how to evaluate those risks and develop control measures specific to the risks that are presented in each of your laboratories. In the WHO biosafety guidance for COVID-19, the recommendations are that initial processing before inactivation of specimens should take place in a validated biosafety cabinet or primary containment device. Non-propagative diagnostic laboratory work may be conducted safely in a biosafety level two laboratory and culturing of the virus needs to be conducted at a higher containment laboratory, such as that presented by a biosafety level three facility. The local guidance in Philippines also follows this approach, whereby routine diagnostic tests can be conducted safely in a BSL-2 laboratory with initial processing and activation of specimens in a certified biosafety cabinet. Specific enhancements as recommended by the WHO have been evaluated and presented for the BSL-2 laboratories handling these specimens. For example, inward directional airflow. Air should flow from areas of low containment outside of the laboratory through the entrance into the laboratory into areas of higher containment where the microorganisms are being handled in the laboratory rooms. It's also recommended that individuals work in a buddy system, 
having two individuals working in the laboratory at all times. These individuals must of course be adequately trained and proficient, not only in the microbiological procedures, but in the biosafety and biosecurity procedures as well. We want to make sure that those individuals are also carefully monitoring their own health status. These individuals need to be fit tested to wear appropriate respiratory protection. We want to restrict access to the laboratory to make sure that authorized personnel are in the laboratory only. And when setting up your workspace for conducting your testing, we want to try and maintain an environment where we work from clean to dirty. And I'll show some examples of that in our biosafety cabinet. Finally, we need to make sure that we've involved our facility maintenance personnel to ensure that all of our equipment and facility is operating as it should. I also want you to keep in mind when preparing your risk-based approach, the hierarchy of controls. We know that personal protective equipment is the last line of defense, not the first. We want to make sure that we can isolate you, the people working in the laboratory from the hazard through the use of engineering controls, such as working in a biological safety cabinet. We don't automatically assume we're safe just because we're wearing PPE. PPE should be our last line of defense. And there are many other processes and procedures, engineering controls that can be put in place to protect you, the worker, from the dangerous materials that you are working with. I wanted to make a, a small point about point of care testing. Each point of care platform, rapid diagnostic assays, for example, use different processes and procedures, and it's difficult to generalize safety recommendations for all types of point of care testing. Once again, based on the laboratory biosafety guidance from the World Health Organization, it will depend on your local risk assessment, what particular point of care testing platform you are using, as well as the practices and procedures and the facilities that you have to do this work. The WHO guidance document does say that this type of activity could be carried out on a bench outside of a laboratory environment providing strict controls and other elements are in place. They've listed for you a number of different recommendations if this procedure were to take place. We need to have a well-ventilated laboratory area free from clutter performed in a specific area on a large absorbent paper towel, for example. We need to make sure that individuals have appropriate PPE but the two issues that I want to highlight in terms of these recommendations are that staff must be well-trained in good microbiological practices and procedures, and staff should not be rushed or have any increased pressure to turn around tests in a very quick time. So let's spend a few minutes talking about good microbiological practices and procedures, because in some cases, this is not always achievable in our laboratories around the world. Many individuals may not be fully trained in good microbiological techniques to avoid aerosols when working in the laboratory. For example, when mixing and homogenizing, do we know how to safely do that? We are not supposed to be inverting tubes up and down for mixing, which could create aerosols. Do we know how to use a pipette properly? We don't want to be blowing any material out of the bottom of a pipette. We don't want to be mixing materials using a pipette. Instead, one puts the end of the pipette on the inner side of the tube and gently drains the material down into the tube. There are also many different procedures for using an inoculating loop. For example, we don't streak across plates that have bubbles in them, which could create aerosols. We don't insert a hot loop that has just been cleaned in the Bunsen burner into the cool media to cool the loop as this could also create aerosols. And there are many, many other good microbiological practices when we're working with samples and specimens in the laboratory. One of the problems that we've seen during the current pandemic is an increase in newly hired personnel. 
And techniques may also be compromised because of the increased workload, um, increased and longer working hours, and many other factors, which can limit the ability of technicians to implement these good microbiological practices. This was a study that was carried out by Public Health England. And in the image here, you'll see the last drop being blown out of a pipette and the number of aerosols that could be created. In their study, they looked at experienced individuals shown in blue here and inexperienced shown in green. To the left of the chart are individuals who underwent training in good microbiological practices and to the right are those that did not have such training. And you can see that those without the training and those that are inexperienced generated a lot more aerosols during a serial dilution of a spore solution, showing you the importance of being trained in these specific good microbiological practices. Another issue to consider is that we know that the most common root cause of laboratory accidents and exposures are really human error and failure to follow good standing operating procedures. Here in Canada, it's mandatory that laboratory exposures are reported to our national health agency. Each year they produce a report on the laboratory acquired infections and year after year, we see that the root causes are really human error and failure to follow good standing standard operating procedures. Taking all of this into consideration, locally in the Philippines, the RITM has evaluated point of care testing and has produced a recommendation position paper on this. And as a result, they are recommending that this type of work be carried out within a laboratory using a biological safety cabinet. So once again, I would encourage you to please consult these recommendations when setting up your individual laboratory practices and procedures. A word about biological safety cabinets because they are so important in the work that we're doing in the laboratory. Everyone working in the cabinet should be familiar with how it works and the air flows within this unit. There are a number of different types of cabinets, but the particular one that I'm showing you here is what we call a class two type A2 cabinet. Air is recirculated within the cabinet to provide you a sterile working area. And it is also discharged into the laboratory through a HEPA filter to ensure that the laboratory is not compromised either. You'll see this individual holding, holding a smoke pencil at the entrance of the cabinet. That is what we call the air curtain. And that is what protects you from the microorganisms inside the cabinet. This air curtain at the front face of the cabinet is very delicate and can be easily compromised by people walking back and forth behind you while you're working in the cabinet. Perhaps you have an air conditioning unit that might be blowing down towards the cabinet. We want to make sure that our biosafety cabinet is located away from these areas in a quiet corner of the laboratory. Also, when you're working in the cabinet and your arms are across the barrier, we want to make sure that you mini minimize movement of your arms in and out of the cabinet, bringing materials in and out of the cabinet. We want to ensure that that air barrier is maintained at all times while you're working in the cabinet. Another important element is how you set up your biosafety cabinet and conduct your work. It's really all about the practices and procedures. We've spoken about good microbiological technique and that will help to eliminate aerosols that may be within that cabinet. It's also very important to set up your cabinet such that you're working from a clean area to a dirty area in order to eliminate any cross contamination. Remember not to put the absorbent pad or any materials on that air grill and make sure that we line the surface of the cabinet with that absorbent pad. If any drops from your pipette or any other materials you're working with were to fall down onto the surface, they would easily be absorbed into that absorbent material 
instead of splashing and creating aerosols on the surface of your cabinet. Another important element is the image to the right, where you see the air being split. Half of the air that comes down over your work surface is drawn towards the front grill of the cabinet. The other half of the air is drawn towards the back grill of the cabinet. Each cabinet has its own unique line where this split occurs. So when someone says to you, please work towards the back of your cabinet, this is why we want to take the air from your working surface towards the back instead of towards the front where you're sitting. So this is what we don't want to see. Here is an image in a laboratory and I'm sure that you can pick out some of the issues. We can just look at a few of them. Um, you'll see that there are tubes coming out of the cabinet over that grill. You can see that she does not have appropriate PPE in that her wrists are bare. The cabinet is somewhat overloaded and maybe compromising the airflow. You can see a large discard container beside her. One should not be taking materials in and out, in and out to discard. Rather, your discard container, a smaller one, should be present inside the laboratory, inside the biosafety cabinet. So when you go back to your laboratories, I would encourage you to have a look at the setup in your biosafety cabinet to ensure that it's set up properly. Now we say a lot about ensuring that biosafety cabinets must be certified. Why is that important and what does that mean? We want to make sure that those HEPA filters have been tested and they are not leaking. It's also important to ensure proper airflow velocities. Is the velocity of the air coming into that front grill sufficient to provide that air barrier? And what are the smoke patterns? What are the airflow patterns within your cabinet? So please ensure that your biosafety cabinets have been certified and tested by a professional who knows how to carry out these tests. And I would encourage you to watch them while they're doing this and to gain a better understanding of certification, the tests that are being done and why it's important. A word about disinfection. We get asked many times whether or not this particular virus is susceptible to the disinfectants that are commonly used in your laboratory. In this chart here, you can see the different types of microorganisms and their general resistance patterns to disinfectants. More resistant organisms are bacterial spores, mycobacteria, and non-enveloped viruses. SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus and it is generally very susceptible to the commonly used disinfectants in your laboratory, such as 70% ethanol and sodium hypochlorite. With respect to decontamination, I just wanted to point out one particularly important issue and that is validating your autoclave procedure. Now there are many different types of indicators that you can use to try and validate this procedure and make sure that your autoclave process is working properly. Of course, there are mechanical indicators in the autoclave that generate printouts and displays, and you can easily look at those to make sure the parameters have been met and the cycle has gone through its proper process. We also see the use of autoclave tape which turns color when exposed to heat. Now this does not necessarily mean that sterilization has occurred or that the parameters that might enable sterilization could occur. It simply means that this tape has been exposed to a certain temperature. Moving up the scale in terms of um, validating procedures, one can also look at chemical indicator strips. This provides some additional guidance on whether or not the parameters of sterilization could have been met. It does not necessarily mean sterilization occurred, but that the conditions were there that it could have occurred. Then we move on to biological indicators. And this is really your means of validating your autoclave to ensure that the spores within those indicators have been appropriately sterilized. 
So please use biological indicators on a routine basis to validate your process in your COVID-19 laboratories to ensure that all waste is appropriately decontaminated. A word now about emergency procedures. It's very important that we conduct our regular drills of mock spills and any other potential scenario in our laboratories using the appropriate materials that we would use should a spill occur. We can watch a video about cleaning up a spill. We can watch a demonstration, but only by doing it ourselves in our own laboratories using our own spill response materials will we be comfortable and ready to address any emergency should it occur. And you can use a number of different um, training tools when setting up your mock spill scenarios. For example, this particular scenario uses a fluorescent powder um, within the spill and you can trace that powder and determine whether or not it was appropriately decontaminated, whether or not during the spill procedure, any further contamination was spread. So please, I encourage you to carry out regular drills in your own laboratories using your own spill response materials. Let's move away now from biosecurity and spend a few minutes looking at, bi move away from biosafety, I should say, and spend a few minutes talking about biosecurity. We need to think about two threats an outsider threat where an individual may be an opportunist, opportunistic and be willing or ready to steal pathogens from poorly secured clinical laboratories. Or it could be an insider threat. Remember, we're increasing the number of individuals with access to these pathogens during an outbreak setting. Many countries are rapidly scaling up their human resources, perhaps focusing on diagnostic, um, capabilities and not necessarily on background checks. Now the likelihood of such an event occurring is probably quite low, but it does exist and it's something that we should not ignore. Now when thinking about biosecurity measures for COVID-19 during a pandemic scenario, we really want to try and balance the need for effective biosecurity without overemphasizing this threat. Consider the complexity of the response on the front lines. Our teams out there are already struggling with infection control procedures, with biosafety practices. We don't want to add any additional unnecessary burdens that may in fact increase their risk. So let's try and implement biosecurity measures that are already integrated within the practices and procedures that they're carrying out now. And there are many simple things we can do. For example, increasing awareness among all of our frontline workers. Let them understand that this outbreak could create circumstances in which individuals may have malicious intent and may wish to access this virus. Encourage them to report suspicious behaviors. Ensure that all patient areas and laboratories have restricted access and we know the people that are entering these facilities. Other simple measures that can be done, ensuring that there is a chain of custody sign off with respect to the samples, knowing who you are handling the sample to if you are taking samples and delivering them to the laboratory. We also want to make sure that we don't have a lot of samples unnecessarily in facilities all over the country. Is it possible if we wish to keep a repository of samples that they are consolidated into as few locations as possible? We know from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, there were many, many orphan samples around many countries that had to be cleaned up afterwards. So let's make sure we decontaminate all potentially contaminated samples that we have no use for and that there are no orphan samples in many facilities across the country. Finally, it's important to understand that with respect to biosecurity and pathogenic organisms, it's not an approach in terms of guards, guns and gates. 
The effectiveness of this program really depends first and foremost on the integrity of the individuals who have access to these samples and specimens. Enhancing a culture of responsibility will greatly increase biosecurity within your facilities. And a key component of that is leadership. Our leaders, our laboratory directors, our laboratory supervisors are an important part of this. Together, we can collectively enhance this culture of trust, accountability, and responsibility. In addition to biosafety and biosecurity, let's also not forget other occupational health and safety issues. We know that many of you are working extended hours with an increased workload, but it's still important that we provide you with a safe work environment, access to essential supplies, hand washing soap, gloves, respirators, that you have appropriate working hours, including regular breaks. You understand how to monitor for symptoms of the disease and that there is support for you in terms of your wellness and counseling as may be needed. Training is also very important and RITM, BIRA, PAMET have been providing a lot of training. They have webinars, they have a lot of different training materials that are available to you. So I would encourage you to reach out to all of these organizations to help you and support you in your training. Finally, training is one thing, but I want you to consider the issues of competency. Being trained and being competent are two different elements. The International Federation of Biosafety Associations does offer a demonstration of competency through our professional certifications in a variety of different subject matter related to biosafety and biosecurity. This provides an independent validation of your competency in the safe and secure handling of biological materials. Many professionals throughout the ASEAN region and Philippines have gone through this certification program. They find that they have a good in-depth understanding of best practices, but more so they find they have greater credibility to influence change in behaviors, in laboratories, in individuals that they're providing training to, and increase confidence and support from management. So I encourage you to consider the issue of professional certification in addition to training in biosafety and biosecurity. So in closing, I would just like to say that biosafety and biosecurity professionals are a key part of the response efforts for COVID-19. So what can you do? We've talked about risk-based approaches that are practical and sustainable over the long term. Be critical thinkers. Focus on applying your knowledge to solutions that are appropriate to your laboratories. Support and provide guidance and advice to your national authorities, to BRA, to PAMAT, in developing policies, procedures, and training materials for safely handling COVID-19. And share with each other your experiences, your knowledge, and internationally as well. We would love to hear from you in terms of your guidance, your experiences, and what we can share with other countries. So with that, I will say thank you, and I will pass it back to Larry. Thank you, Maureen, for linking biosafety, biosecurity, competency, and COVID-19, and also for emphasizing that one size fits all is the thing of the past, and that risk-based, locally-driven approach is a more successful and sustainable way of addressing the current COVID-19 challenges. Now park your questions for Maureen as we continue with the second learning session. We will have your questions answered after the second learning session. Our second speaker is a prolific biosafety and biosecurity advocate. She began her career in biomedical research laboratory where she worked for about 10 years, after which she switched to research operations and laboratory safety. She now holds the position of Associate Dean in the Duke National University of Singapore Medical School. In, in this role, she oversees safety, health, and emergency management. 
procurement and research operations. She also chairs the School Safety and Crisis Management Committee, where oversees all aspects of safety and emergency preparedness in the school. Safety science is a passion that she has nurtured in the last three decades, especially the integration of safety into daily work life. In addition to safety-related portfolio in Duke NUS, she also serves in various organizations related to the practice of bio-risk. From 2014 to 2017, she was the president of the Biorisk Association of Singapore, and upon completion of her term, she continued to serve as a member for several years. She is currently a member of the board of directors of the International Federation of Biosafety Association and vice president of Asia Pacific Biosafety Association. She also consults in the field of biorisk for various organizations like the European Union, CBRN, Centers of Excellence, World Health Organization, through their partner agencies, Global Affairs Canada, through their projects in Southeast Asia. She has completed a WSQ Advanced Certificate in Training and Assessment, which specializes in adult training methodologies, and she has a master's degree in Human Factors and Systems Safety from Lund University in Sweden. Her extensive expertise in the field of biorisk, together with the knowledge she has gained through the master's program, gives her a specific set of skills and abilities that enables her to develop and implement biorisk management systems with a distinctive approach. Her training style incorporates knowledge that she has gathered over the years, not only in the field of biology, but other industries like aviation, railways, and others. Her motto is that safety is simply how you work. Dear participants, please welcome our second speaker, Associate Professor, Dr. Viji Vijayan. Hello, everybody. How are you? Oma Bahai. And uh, usually I cannot sit still in one place. And the stuff that I really like about uh, the Philippines is all the singing and dancing, but we won't have any of that this time. Uh, I need to just make sure uh, I'm heard, right? Somebody can tell me it's okay. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. V. Perfect, perfect. Okay, now let me share my screen. That's the first thing I have to do. Um, Okay, and I suppose you can see the screen too now, right? Yes, Dr. B. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm here to talk about risk assessment and control measures. Earlier on, um, you know, Ma Maureen was talking and then she to told you guys a lot of things about uh, what's the theory behind various things and how you should take care of things. And one of the things she said, and one of the things the, in, the person's introducing us said, is it must be risk-based and it must be locally applicable. So that's my passion. Don't just cut and paste from somewhere, make sure it's applicable in your own setting. So let me start with that. Very simple, what is biosafety? And um, I hope you will understand. And please also remember at the end of it, you have to do some assessments. So all the answers are here, you must pay attention. And then, so the most important part of biosafety is really to prevent the lab worker from getting infected while performing the work. And this infection, if it occurs in a lab, is called a lab acquired infection. And then you have to make sure that you handle the infectious agents safely and you contain the infections agent, infectious agents. So containment is a technical term that people use when they talk about biosafety, because what you're saying is you are not allowing the biological agent to spread all over, either through infecting a person and that person going home or just being released out of the lab, but you're containing the infections agent. So that, that um, phenomenon is called containment. So there's something called biosecurity and this also uh, the previous speaker Maureen explained about. So what is that? In biosecurity, 
Let me use this. In biosecurity, the main objective is to ensure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. What about the terrorists? What about the baddies? What about all those people? So we have to make sure that it doesn't fall in their hands. And so you have to control the access. And it is not just the material, it is also the data. Because if really you think of it, if the genome sequence of a virus is available and there is a scientist who's willing to create this virus for a bad purpose, they can easily do it. In fact, if I just read up a bit, I can create one in my, in my kitchen because it's not that difficult. You can buy all these material. So the information is also equally important, not just the material. You need to be vigilant about what goes on. Again, there can be insider threat, there can be outsider threat. And insider threat is definitely a problem now because so many new people are coming in to help you guys and help everybody else to do the diagnosis. Okay, so be attentive. Together, biosafety and biosecurity is called bio risk. That's all, it's not rocket science. So there is something called bio risk management system. So there's a bio risk and now you have to manage it. What you have to do is in a systematic way, you enable the labs and the related facilities to achieve the biosafety and biosecurity objective, which is to keep people safe and to make sure that the, age, the biological agents are safe and don't get into the wrong hands. It consists of several things, the physical layout of the facility, engineering, that means heating, ventilation and air conditioning and how the air flows and definitely the biosafety cabinet. Biosafety cabinet is the one place where you can safely do your work and it is, a, it is a primary barrier between you and the infectious agent. So that is why it is very important to use it carefully and use it correctly, just like what Maureen said. And then there are administrative measures, training. If you let an untrained person in there, no amount of biosafety cabinet or physical layout or anything else can save them. So training is very important. And then there's going to be documentation of processes. I will talk about it in a moment. Then there is personal protective equipment. I also saw some questions about the same thing. Gloves, mask, what should you wear? What should you not wear? How much of it do you have? And uh, where should you use it? So money is not infinite, right? It will dry up sometime. Just like now PPE is so difficult to get. So you must make sure you assess where you are going to use it. So you get the most benefit from using the PPE. <clears throat> The two main principles of bio risk management are risk assessment and containment. Con containment, I already told you, how you contain the, the biological agent and then risk assessment, which is the main topic of my talk. So if you look at the bio risk management system and you go to all these um, internet places and you see there will be CWA something, OSAS, there's a lot of stuff. And in many places in Southeast Asia, when I go there to teach them, they get daunted by it. There's so much to do and so much to understand and so much to implement. Don't do that. Very simply, you have to identify the hazard. You have to do the risk assessment and mitigate. Mitigate means control. Once you assess the risk, you control the risk and incident reporting. Pretty much these are the key things in any bio risk management system. You can start with having this. And if you want to later on, you can add all the more beautiful and fluff stuff inside there, but this is the key. So what is hazard identification? Hazards are present in everything we do. When we collect a specimen, when we transport a specimen, when we open the tubes, when we perform the work, it can be biological. In our labs, we know we use chemical. There's also physical, you can trip and fall. It can be electrical and various things. So when you are assessing the biological risk, don't forget about the other risk like chemical, physical, and other risks that are also present in a lab. Let me explain to you. It's usually nice, easier for you all to understand if I explain with an example that each and every one of you do every day. Cross the road. See these two people, they are being good. They're looking left and right and then crossing carefully. Like if I go to Philippines, I never know which way to look because you guys drive on the other side of the road as me. <clears throat> so maybe you'll have the same problem when you come here. And then there's another crossing the road. How many of you have done this? I myself am guilty of it. And this one, if you went to India, there's no way you can cross the road. If you look right and left, you will just be waiting there forever. So you have to learn how to cross the road. So what is the, the thing I'm going to tell you? There is a hazard, but there is a benefit. What is the benefit? To reach the other side of the road. Maybe you have a meeting. 
Maybe you're meeting your girlfriend. Maybe you have to do it. So there is a benefit. Every risk that you take will have a benefit and they have to be taken into account together. So these are hazards, right? Let's look at air travel. I love to give examples of air travel because in my master's program, there were many pilots. And when you listen to everything the pilots do, you feel like never flying again. I wish I could take a train or walk everywhere. So you look at this, the number of deaths is very, very low by kilometer, by hours, and compared to all the other people by hours. See, this may billion hours, but the number of death is very low. So what I'm trying to say is, Air travel is safer than many other types of travel, yet is the risk zero. The risk is never zero. If anybody tells you the risk is zero, tell them to come and talk to me. It's never zero. What we are doing is we are reducing it to an acceptable level in such a way that the benefit is worth taking the risk. So you always take this weighing scale, you put benefit on one side, you do risk on one side. It's like getting married, it's like having kids, it's the same thing, right? Everywhere. And you constantly weigh the benefits and the risk. And then, then you decide what is the acceptable risk. And then you proceed to take that risk. Every day we do this in our minds. We are doing this every day in our minds. Maybe we don't write it down and, uh, and uh, let this, somebody come and audit you, but you do it. So at work, we cannot do it in our minds. We have to document it because somebody is paying us a salary and we have an employer and there'll be auditors and there'll be lots of questions. So you will have to write all this down and document it. One of the reasons why you document is so that everybody follows the same exactly. So this everybody following the same is not only for safety, but it is definitely also for uh, it is definitely also for actually providing the diagnosis. Safety by itself is not, it, it, if you have only safety and nothing else, it is a waste of money, waste of effort and waste of everything else. There must be productivity. So when you take safety into account, you also have to take productivity into account. So if you are making a diagnosis and you tell somebody you must incubate this for two minutes and then this person by word of mouth tells everybody else two minutes, but it, but it just changes and then somebody else incubates for four minutes. The diagnosis you give is going to be all wrong. Then what's the point in being safe if you cannot give the correct diagnosis? So remember, you're documenting not only to be safe, but also to ensure that your productivity, your diagnosis, your research results, or whatever it is that you're doing is also correct. And that is why we have to make sure that we document. It can be used for training, and it can be also used for audits and performance monitoring to see how you perform. Did you provide the correct diagnosis? Did you do the work correctly? Did you calibrate your machines? So you have to document all these things for these reasons in the workplace. How do you document them? You can't just scribble in, your, in, your, in a piece of paper, right? Nobody will understand what you wrote. So you have to write something called a standard operating procedure. The standard operating procedure will be all the work that you do. Please don't write long documents because nobody reads it write precise what is important, what is necessary. Do not cut and paste from somewhere else. Make sure that it is what you can do. My motto, write what you do and do what you write. Because otherwise you'll be copying and pasting from somewhere else without understanding anything that you're doing. And then it, the document and what you do will be completely disconnected. That's no use. Then you may as well not have an SOP. And so can you have the SOP just in your head and not written down in many of the regions that I go to train, they don't have it. They don't have any written documents. And then they said they, they have it in their head because they've done it for so long. But what if the manufacturer had made a change? What if something had changed? How are they going to know this information? What if they say, make a mistake and say the wrong thing? So you must write it down. It must be consistent. The diagnosis for COVID, if you all are giving wrong diagnosis, being safe is doesn't make any sense. So you must, Safety must always be taken into account with the productivity. So that accuracy of the results is as important as your safety. I'm not saying your safety is not important, but I'm saying that both of them are important and you, they should work hand in hand. So the SOP of an activity like diagnosis for COVID-19, that's where I like to make the starting point for hazard identification, risk assessment and mitigation, because 
how do you identify the hazard and do the risk assessment and do the mitigation? You do it based on the work that you do. So if you're walking down the street, then that's the work. But if you're doing diagnosis for COVID-19, then that's the work. So that can be the starting point to identify the hazard, assess the risk and do the mitigation. Hazards are present everywhere, right? Does every hazard pose a risk? Unfortunately, if I was in the classroom, I would have pointed to one of you and said, give me an answer, but COVID does not make that easy for me. I'm very sad. I'm not there, right there with you in the Philippines. But let me explain in the best possible way through Zoom. This is a PowerPoint. We all know this. There can be nobody in this audience of 1,000 people who don't know what this is. Every day, there is in Singapore, there is 230 volts. I think in some other countries, there'll be 110 volts. There will be 13 amps or something like this. It's inside there. You will only, that will be a risk if you put your finger inside there and your feet is on the ground so the current can pass through you and then it could kill you or you can get a really bad jolt. But otherwise, it is a hazard. It's the same hazard every day, but it does not pose a risk because as an adult, you are not going to stick your finger inside there. I hope you're not going to, yeah? If you, are, if you have been doing it, stop doing it now. But what if you have a small child? Now suddenly that hazard has become a risk, which it was not before. And then what you can do is put all these measures to mitigate the risk. So this is the difference between a hazard, a risk, and mitigation of risk. I hope that is clear. Okay, I'll move on. This is something called risk assessment and we do a five by five matrix. Some of you may have known. So on one side, we have likelihood. That means how, how likely is this to happen? So with a little two-year-old child, some putting their finger inside the power socket is almost certain, unless it's a very obedient child. But if without any children in the house, is probably rare, okay? And what is the consequence? Consequence means the ill effect, the ill health, the injury. Is it very small? No big deal. Is it minor? Is it moderate? Is it major? Is it catastrophic like this COVID-19? So this is how you do a five by five matrix risk assessment because it's one to five. And all the green stuff is low risk. The orange is medium risk and the red is high risk. In Singapore, if any activity at work is deemed to be at high risk, you have to mitigate it down to medium or low before work is allowed. And this risk assessment you do after you put in the mitigation, mitigating measures, not before, so that you can give a more realistic answer. For example, you, you're wearing a certain PPE or doing certain things, catching the coronavirus is very low. So you, don't, you shouldn't put it high because you are wearing the PPE and you are being trained and you're probably working inside a biosafety cabinet. Okay, then we have to assess what is the consequence. I told you consequence is the in ill health. If it's insignificant means almost no injuries or financial loss. If it's minor, maybe you just need first aid treatment. If it's moderate, then maybe you have to go and see the doctor. If it's major, then it's extensive injuries, loss of production capability, offside release and, and things like that. So with no detrimental effect, that means it's not affecting the rest of the world. It's catastrophic if there's death toxic release of site with detrimental effect and huge financial loss, okay? Then we have to also have likelihood. Then, so you will say, if it rarely occurs, it's exceptional. Unlikely, then it could occur at some times. Possible, then it might occur at some times. This is a play of words, but don't worry, I will explain how to do this. Likely means most probably occur, almost certain is expected to occur. So being hit by a car, it's probably possible when you're when you're walking with, while while talking on the phone. It's probably possible, but probably not this too because the car driver also doesn't want you to have a hit anybody, so he's also careful. Okay, so you can put the numbers one to five in this way. So let me look at this matrix risk assessment. The matrix risk assessment is a qualitative risk assessment because there's numbers one to five. It's not quantitative. Quantitative risk assessment means you get actual numbers. For example, in histology labs, they use the paraformaldehyde. What is the amount of paraformaldehyde that can be in the air, parts per million? You actually have to calculate it because above a certain parts per million, it is not good for the health of the people. So that is quantitative. This risk assessment matrix is still qualitative. 
The advantage is it's easy to perform and doesn't need much special training. There is definite disadvantages. One is it's subjective. I may say four, you may say three, somebody else may say something else. If you don't have a big uh, problem between one and five, I think it's good. Some people say four and some people say five. Whenever auditors come, they will tell me, oh, this one should have been a five. Then the next auditor will come, this one should have been a four. And now I re kept a record of all that and show it to the auditors every time they come. Between four and five, it's okay. It, it's not such a big deal. But one and five, there's a big deal. It's based on past knowledge, right? How often does it occur is based on past knowledge. So these are the disadvantages. Who should perform the risk assessment? It cannot be some manager or senior manager sitting there and writing this risk assessment and giving it to you say, here, this is what you need to do. No, the workers have to be involved. The people actually doing the work have to be involved in this, okay? Don't cut and paste. And it should be based on the local situation. How is your lab built? Is there a staircase? Is there a corridor? Is there a lock? All these things will play into how you do the risk assessment. So it has to be done for your particular site by the people who are working inside there. In COVID, I'm gonna now give you some examples of things. And um, okay, I'm gonna end the slideshow in a moment for a moment because I'm going to give you some examples of things, right? Uh, okay, so this is a risk assessment, and can you all still see it? Yes, Dr. Viti. I think you can still see it. Okay, so this is how we do the five by five matrix risk assessment. So we, you can go by material, you can go by equipment, and you can go by the activity. This is one method that we use, and if you like it, you can use this. So in, if you are using SARS coronavirus 2, there's a biological hazard. And there's also cross-contamination because what happened in the previous SARS in Singapore, there was a lab-acquired infection in one lab. And the way it happened was because this person didn't realize that live SARS coronavirus had actually contaminated what he thought was inactivated. So contamination is definitely a problem and you have to be careful. So I told you there's something called lab-acquired infection. You can get that. So how do you control? BSE will be used. I'll talk about that later. PPE will consist of these things. There is a waste management program. After you have done everything, after you have taken the swabs, after you have done your RNA extraction and all those things, you can't just throw the swab. You must have a way to manage the waste. Staff training. Staff training, as Maureen pointed out in the new WHO manual, human factors and training is given very, very much importance compared to before. And you can even say the senior staff will handle samples that have the higher potential to infect and the junior staff will handle other things when it is not infectious. It's up to you. All this is up to you. These are just examples. So again, if you have a lot of ethanol, there's a fire hazard, so you must keep it in a proper place. So I'm going to talk about the gene excerpts, experts. So I just put it here. Is there a problem in this? Is there a physical injury? Is there electric shock? These are all up to you to decide based on what you do. If you're using a biosafety cabinet, what happens if there's a malfunction? There will be an alarm, but what do you do? Do the people know what to do? Is it written somewhere? Have they been trained? These are very, very critical. Accidents happen when you least expect, expect it and a lot of things line up and then you will have accidents. That's the problem with accidents and you really don't know when they will happen. Okay, so this is an example that I took from the internet for an SOP. Now, this is the gene expert SOP, what they have given the insert. There's a lot of stuff. You keep the SOP simple, otherwise people will not read it and it will not be much use. So they're explaining how to do the nasal swab and the throat swab. The way I teach people is the SOP is your starting point because that is the activity you're going to do. I like them to put a sticker in a place where there is a hazard. Now you all sit together, say, okay, these are the hazardous areas where there's a risk of lab infection. And I will put in here a sticker so that the people who are looking at it will know that this sticker means there's a risk there. So I put it in various places and you should look at it and put it over here. Maybe there's, a, there's, there's one here. And you do the risk assessment for those places in which you put the sticker, okay? Now, even this risk assessment, I, I am a very big fan of not over-documenting. In Singapore, we over-document a lot of things because we think the more documents we have, the safer we are. We are wrong. Whoever says that you are wrong. It must be the correct amount 
enough to convey the message, enough to be a source of information that the people can go to when they need. If you write volumes and volumes, people who have to provide diagnosis for you know, 100 patients a day are not going to be able to read that. And the final purpose of this is to keep the people safe. I wanted to say something about bench aids. In one of the countries that I visited, they had a lot of bench aids. These are small half page laminated things that they stick at the lag bench so that they can have a quick look to see what it is that they must be watching out for. Okay, so you can also have bench aids, it's okay, but it's good to be documented and perhaps numbered. So again, I'm gonna talk about this BRM, BRMO position, so I won't go into my uh, slide presentation first, okay? So this is, this is what uh, Ian and Martin and they all sent me. Now what happens is that the WHO says that if you use the gene ex expert, you can take, you can do it in certain ways. So these are what they are suggesting. Perform on a diaper. Maureen also said that. Why diaper? If there's a spill, you can throw it away. The under part of the diaper is plastic, so it won't soak through and contaminate more surface. You must wear PPE. The correct PPE, including covering the wrist, right? You must use a risk assessment. You must do that and you must see what is the respiratory protection. There are many countries in which I have gone, they use N95, but they have never heard of a fit test. There is no much use wearing an N95 if you cannot do the fit test. But there are even videos in which how you can try, you can see if you can, on the top of your nose, whether the air comes out, you must be able to do something. Wear trained stuff in good microbiological practice. No rush, can you see this part? No rush or increased pressure. So if you rush, definitely this, the an accident is more possible. So they have put all these things and they have put guidelines here. This is a BM, BRMO document that the guidelines say for gene expert, you can perform below BSL too, but BMRO has a position and I'm going to come to that. Now, why do they say that? Why don't they say, no, we don't agree. You must do it in a BSC. You must do it here. You must do it there because you look at the benefit. What is the benefit? We are in a pandemic. You have to be able to ramp up your diagnosis. If you put these conditions, then you may not be able to ramp up the diagnosis. And this gene expert itself is done in such a way that there are cartridges and you don't have so much contact with the actual sample. That is a reason why they allow this. Risk benefit ratio is the key to making sure that there is benefit. If on the other hand, there was no benefit, there was no pandemic, you're only providing two diagnoses, then you don't take that risk. That is very, very important, okay? So here, there's one statement that um, BRMO has. They've written it here, right? So you see, let me just go here. Sorry about that. So BRMO recommends that it should be done in a laboratory facility with biosafety class two cabinet and a dedicated area for doffing and donning. So they say this, WHO says something else. Now you work with your local authorities and see what is your local risk assessment. That is the key here, okay? You must have your own local risk assessment. I put it here because you can look at various guidelines and if I can send you the slides and you can look at those later. So I'm gonna quickly go back. I think I have a few more minutes. So in COVID, what do you think are the SOPs? This is what I came up with, but you may, you may not agree with me. So you must come up with this sample collection. That is where the hazard is highest, right? The risk is highest. Transportation, diagnosis, you must have something for training to make sure that they are trained and competent, simply attending the training, ticking yes or no, doing the multiple choice questions don't mean anything if you're not competent at the workstation. Waste management has to be managed and incident reporting. Let me explain what incident reporting means. Incident means it is a work-related event, but it can be a leisure or home-related event too, but we are only responsible for work, people who come to work right now. It is it, which, in which an injury or ill health has occurred or could have occurred, a fatality also, could have or has occurred. If it has occurred, then it becomes an accident. If it could have occurred, it is a near miss. Now, a silent system is not a safe system. People should be able to report near misses. People should be able to learn about the near misses so that they do not become an accident. There must be no reprisal. And this kind of system in safety science is called just culture, J-U-S-T. That means you're being just, 
you're being um, uh, not judgmental and there's no reprisal. The more of these things you talk about, you will be able to prevent it so that it does not actually become an accident. I'll leave you with one thought. This is how I work with safety. Safety is simply the way we work. Don't think that safety is a separate SOP and work is a separate SOP. It's all together. You have to incorporate safety into your work because if there is no productivity, being safe is totally no use to anybody else. Thank you very, very much for listening. And I hope you listened and didn't go off to sleep. Thank you, Dr. Vijay, for concretizing the initially mentioned risk-based approach by providing specific and clear examples of risk assessment that we can confidently use as basis of our decisions and actions in trying to protect and preserve the life of our colleague and that of the general public. Now we are in the Q&A portion and I'll be reading questions from uh, our participants. And uh, as uh, requested, I'll be uh, calling the name of uh, our resource person who's going to answer first and additional uh, inputs may be coming from uh, the other resource person. So uh, the first question is directed to uh, Maureen, and this is rather a uh, direct question. Uh, is the room required to be negative pressure? I think this is the laboratory where COVID testing is being conducted. Is it required to be under negative pressure? Thank you for that question. I think by negative pressure, what we're referring to is inward directional airflow. This means that the pressure inside the laboratory is lower than the pressure outside of the laboratory. So that air flows from the corridor on the outside into the laboratory room. For a biosafety level two laboratory, yes, it is recommended that the laboratory be designed with inward directional airflow. If we move up to a biosafety level three laboratory, then definitely we also need to ensure that there is inward directional airflow into the laboratory. This is a safeguard measure. Let's say you were to have a, a spill in the laboratory. We don't want to have any of those infectious aerosols going out of the laboratory into the corridor where other people who are not wearing PPE may be present. Thank you, Maureen. Is there something else that you would like to say, Dr. Vidi? Uh, yeah, I, I want to say one thing. Yes, absolutely, Maureen um, definitely is right, and it must have inward airflow. But sometimes in the region, when you go there to, when I go there to help people out, they don't have this kind of facility, and they don't have the, you know, they don't have the resources, the money to change it into inward airflow. Number one, number two. We are in a pandemic situation, so in, a, in some times you may be asked to, to do something which is not ideal. So then again, that's where the local risk assessment comes into play. What are the other ways in which you can mitigate? If you can do inward airflow, that is really the most important and the best way to do it. But if you can't, then that's where the local risk assessment comes in. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. The next question, uh, I think I have to group this question because uh, these are related. I'd like to ask first, uh, is it good to use washable PPEs? Uh, I would like to direct this question to Dr. Vijay. Is it good to use washable PPEs? Yeah. Okay, when you, when you say washable PPE, what is the PPE? Is the PPE material able to wash? There are very clear, uh, there are some guidelines even in the CDC and the WHO website about how, how and when you can extend the use of your respirator. So you want to look at those things. So if you ask me, is it good? It depends on what the PPE is. If you're wearing a disposable gown, obviously you cannot wash it and use it. But if you're using a disposable gown and you just don't have the resources to change it every day. There has been one such uh, place to which I went. They just don't have it. They have to use the same one. Uh, they are, it's a poor country. They have to use the same one. Then you try, uh, what we did was we, you spray with a disinfectant, make sure people spray each other and then 
they uh, they put it inside they turn it inside and then leave it in one place for the pp for the um, uh, disinfectant to act and then they can use it again so you can it's, it's not ideal that you should wash a disposable gown because that is not meant for washing but you Thank check you. The, the text the who and cdc guide uh, they have guidelines about masks and how they can extend the use and reuse Thank you, Dr. Viji, for sharing that information. Maureen, is there something else that you would like to add to that? I would only add that in perhaps a laboratory environment where um, you're maybe in a BSL-2 environment, you're wearing laboratory coats and you want those coats to be reused and washed, um, you may want to consider autoclaving the coats before sending them to a central laundry, for example. So it really depends on the setup in your um, particular laboratory environment, but we don't want to be sending any potentially contaminated lab coats to um, a central laundry facility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, related to the uh, PPEs or the washable PPEs, uh, what are some important considerations in reusing PPE among frontliners, which is really, uh, is happening now in the Philippines. What are some important considerations in you reusing PPE among frontliners? And one of you can, can answer. Yeah, okay. Well, I would say that um, most of the recommendations for, we understand that there's a shortage, um, but if possible, try and consider extended use instead of reuse. By extended use, I mean wearing the same respirator in between patients who may have the same disease. That's very important. We don't want to wear the same respirator from a COVID patient to a different patient. But if you have five COVID patients in one suite, in one isolation facility, it's safer for you to wear the same respirator for an extended period. And that's because you're not going to be taking your respirator off, putting it on, taking it off. And that provides more opportunity for you to reinfect yourself. There are very good guidelines um, put out, as VG said, by WHO and CDC, going through extended use and reuse. Obviously, if you're leaving the isolation unit and you're going for your break or you're, you're um, going for lunch, then you need to um, remove that respirator and place a new one on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that answered a question that was posted. Uh, the next question is referring to the biosafety cabinet. And I would like to direct this question to Maureen. Are HIPAA filters in biosafety cabinets need to be replaced? Uh, for how long is the filter viable? And how will you know? that it is still viable? Most biosafety cabinets, class two type A2 cabinets have a gauge on the front of the cabinet. It could be digital, it could be a manual gauge. And this is a gauge that will show you the loading of your filter, the number of particulates that are being captured within your filter. At a certain point, your filter could overload and may need to be replaced. That will depend on a number of factors. Um, for example, how dusty is your laboratory? In some environments, for example, in the Middle East, there may be a lot of um, sand and other particulates that may load up your filter more quickly. Your certifi certification that's done annually will be able to determine whether or not your filter is overloading and needs to be changed. But generally speaking, in a clean laboratory environment, you're not going to be redoing and changing your filters every year or every two years. It should not load that quickly. Mm -hmm. Dr. PG, is there something else that you would like to add? No, no, that's it. She's replied very well. All right. All right. Thank you. The next question, uh, going back to the face mask, the question is asking, is it good to use ordinary face masks when handling COVID specimens and when communicating COVID to COVID positive patients? I would like to refer this question to Dr. Viji. Yeah. So uh, 
I think uh, definitely a surgical mask is not going to provide the same um, protection as an N95 respirator for sure. And um, why is uh, the first question I would ask is why do you want to do that? Is it because you don't have the N95 respirator? Is that the, is that the reason? Mm -hmm. So uh, then if we just don't have and if it's a question of going with no mask as opposed to a surgical mask, then use a surgical mask, but N95 respirator will definitely give you more protection than, than a surgical mask. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Another question, when taking blood samples from SARS-CoV patients, COVID patients or harboring the SARS-CoV-2 for other laboratory procedures, such as chemistry tests, should we disinfect the tubes before bringing it inside the laboratory? And, uh, I think I'd like to direct this question to Maureen. Yes, it depends on the procedure where that blood tube was drawn. Ideally, we want to try and limit contamination of the paperwork. Um, and if when the sample is drawn, the technician can simply wipe the outer um, tube before placing the tube and the paper together in the um, shipping container. Um, we really want to try and minimize the contamination of the paper at, at the source of where the blood is being drawn. Generally speaking though, you can add in extra precautions such as wiping the tube, but we wanna be careful that any extra precautions or any procedure that you're following doesn't add any additional risks or hazards or steps to the people who are manipulating that particular sample. If it can be done safely and it adds to the safety of the procedure, then yes. But if it is an extra step, sometimes we see extra steps that are put in there that are end up being even more risky. But in this case, let's try and limit contamination at the source. But yes, we can also add in an extra step of wiping the tube. Well, again, uh, it depends on the risk assessment. Yes, correct. Yeah. Another question. I, I think uh, this one was uh, answered, but I'd like uh, the answers to be clarified more. Is it okay to use the respirator again if only just for taking a break for lunch and reuse again, then dispose after a 12-hour shift? I'd like to direct this question to Maureen. It, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of reusing a respirator. So you need to think about the process of removing that respirator before lunch, um, where are you going to put it, and then coming back and putting that respirator back on after lunch. Are you creating a, an unsafe practice for yourself in doing that? So leaving for a break, ideally, if you can, you want to dispose of that and have a new one when you come back from your break. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that answered perfectly. Uh, next question, uh, I'd like to direct this one to Dr. Vigi. How good or what is the mechanism of action of the particulate respirator when I use that in the lab? I think this was explained uh, by uh, Maureen in her lecture. So what, what is the question? What is the mechanism of action, is it? Correct, correct. Yeah, so the, the N95 respirator is the number in 95 because I think it removes 95% of the particulate material from coming into your nose, right? So <clears throat> it's just blocking. And <clears throat> so if you compare the N95 to the normal mask, a normal mask is not made in such a way that it is tested for reducing 95% of the uh, uh, particulate material that can come in. It also, uh, N95 is also uh, able to say that particulate material of a certain size, I cannot remember exactly that, you have to check it online. So certain size, which will filter off all the uh, viruses, that's the idea. But when you wear an N95 mask, you have to do something called a fit test. So that you know that the N95 mask fits snugly and there is no holes on the top here. There's no holes in the bottom. So that air cannot go inside there every time you take an inhalation. So it has to be fitted in the correct way. That's why these N95 masks have definite shape. 
they have a catch on the top. So you have to be careful that you get it properly fitted. And it's a very simple thing to fit. I, I don't know if you all have it there, but it's a simple thing, simple method to fit, do a fit testing. Maureen, is there something else you would like to add? Uh, no, I think Fiji covered that quite nicely. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. Let's proceed to the next question. I think this is uh, striking home. It has been observed that the number of healthcare workers in the Philippines who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 are increasing in a daily basis. What would be your recommendations in order to address this problem? <clears throat> Can I take that? Sure. Okay, Dr. So, Fiji. so this is an international problem, right? So right. It, it's, it, it's not something to do with your lab and, and, and you and how you do the work. The key is testing. Use the correct type of testing, test in the correct place. So if you look at the American, um, if you read the news, they have a lot of tests, but are they testing smart? The only way you can stop this virus from spreading is test and quarantine. <clears throat> These are the only two things. So you must test the right people, you must do the contact tracing, and you must quarantine those who have come into contact with a positive person. And countries that have kept the curve very flat or the numbers low have done this. Simply having the testing is not enough. You have to test the right people. One of the problems they said in the US is the rich people get tested, the other people who really need the test don't get tested. That's no use. You really have to test smart. You have to be able to contact trace. In many Asian countries, they have apps, they have phones and various people. In Singapore, they have several thousand people just doing contact tracing. So, and then when you trace the contact and you know that this person has potentially got the infection, you have to quarantine them. That's the only way to fix this problem until we get a vaccination or something. Thank you. So that's testing properly, appropriately, and testing, uh, tracing, tracing, contact, and quarantine. And quarantine. Yeah. Maureen, is there something else that you'd like to add? For, for, from your well, with respect, with respect to um, seeing an increase in positive laboratory workers, um, we had several laboratory workers here in Canada as well who have tested positive. First and foremost, um, we're not sure. This could, of course, happen through community transmission. Um, so it may or may not be related to their um, specific activities in the laboratory. With respect to the laboratory, as I mentioned, most of the laboratory acquired infections, not all, but many of them are really related to the practices and procedures. So it's, it's critically important that somebody come into the laboratory and watch what's going on, watch you go through your procedures. Are there any improvements that could be made? Um, do staff have the appropriate training in the good microbiological practices and procedures? Have a look at the practices and procedures first and then move on to the facility. Um, is it a, a question with respect to the correct operation of the biosafety cabinet, for example? Probably not so likely. Um, that's more so with truly aerosol-borne diseases such as um, tuberculosis but we really need to have somebody come in with an outside eye and see what's going on in the laboratory and see if they can um, address any deficiencies in the practices and procedures. Thank you, Maureen. I think uh, that's can a I really... add something there? Sure. I, sorry, sure, I missed Dr. Dr. your question. You're talking of laboratory workers getting infected. I'm sorry, so I've, Maureen's answer is correct. I'm talking more of community. I was looking, at, I thought you asked me about the community. I'm sorry about that. That's all right, Dr. Viji, you provided a good input. Now let's proceed to the next question. We have remaining four minutes for the Q&A. Can you use the same autoclave in decontaminating laboratory wastes and for sterilizing materials? Or should it be a separate autoclave for decontaminating waste and one that's for sterilizing material? And I'd like to uh, direct this question to Dr. Viji. So it is okay to use the autoclave for decontaminating the waste as well as for sterilizing uh, for equipment, but it also depends on, is it because you don't have it, have two autoclaves or you have two autoclaves and you're still doing that, then that's not good. But if you don't have two autoclaves, we do it, uh, we also do that. But the, uh, in, especially in small labs, 
The thing is, you must have a robust autoclave monitoring system, the one that Maureen talked about in her lecture. So the autoclave has, you have to make sure that the autoclave monitoring system, including the biological indicators and all that are really up to date. The autoclave is properly serviced. And you know that when you put something inside, it is autoclave. The temperature re reaches, the pressure reaches, and you don't overpack so that the steam cannot get in. If you are doing all these things correctly, then you can use the same autoclave because you don't have a different autoclave. What, what Thank do you, you think, Maureen? Yes, I would agree. Um, ideally, we want our flow in the laboratory from clean to dirty to separate our clean media preparation sterilization, but that's not always possible and therefore you can certainly use the same autoclave if you if you don't have that ideal setup. Thank you. Next question, which is more effective in eliminating the virus as N95 mask or N98 masks? Hmm. I'm, I'm going to let Maureen ask, answer that because... Uh, um, it's like Vigi said, it's a question of filtration efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, N95 filtering out 95% and N99, for example, filtering out 99%. Um, but the N95 is sufficient for filtering out microorganisms and working in the laboratory. Remember that as you increase your mask up to an uh, N99, for example, there will be more breathing resistance. So it will be more difficult to wear that mask over a longer period of time. So you don't just want to bump up your efficiency in your respirator um, when you don't need to. All right. Again, Very here clear. is a risk benefit ratio, right? So every All action right. you take, there will be some other uh, um, uh, reaction. And then if you really wear the N95, you cannot work for very long. You're going to start getting headaches and things. And fatigue is the most common uh, reason for an accident, cause of an accident. So you have to weigh the pros and cons. I agree. I agree. Just what, like you said, you cannot just simply eliminate the risk. You just need to manage it. Another question. What are the instances where a review, update, and revision of the risk assessment is necessary. And I'd like to address this, of course, to Dr. Beasy. Okay, so the risk assessment must be reviewed in periodically. For example, uh, you can say every two years, sometimes we have every three years, it depends on the country and it depends on you. But in between, if there has been an accident or a near miss that was quite serious, if there has been a change in the way you do, the change in the activity, change in the equipment, change in the layout, change in the people who are doing the work. When I say change in the people, I don't mean if you have a new trainee, you have to do a risk assessment. I mean, if there's a significant change, then you must do a risk assessment. The risk assessment is done for the activity that you have documented. But if that activity changes in any way, the workflow, the way your equipment is laid out, the way your lab is laid out, you have to really do the risk assessment again because it changes. And if there is an accident or a significant near miss, you need to make sure. At least you have to review. Maybe you don't have to change anything, but you have to review and decide that you don't have to change it. Mm -hmm. Maureen, is there something else that you would like to add? No, I think VG's covered that very nicely. All right. This is the last question as we are about to close the Q&A. Uh, and I think this is directed to Dr. VG. How is Singapore managing the risk in handling COVID-19 since it has the most number of positive cases in Southeast Asia? Okay, so in Singapore, the community spread is low. The spread is because we had migrant workers who le lived in close quarters in dormitories. So even now the numbers in the dormitories are high, but in the community, out in the community, like people who don't live in the dormitories and people like me, it's still very low, it's in single digits. And again, in the community, it's testing. They have huge amounts of testing capabilities and contact tracing. They also have a lot of people doing the contact tracing. We have an app and we have something called um, safe entry. Every building you enter, you have to use a barcode uh, so that you people know you've entered. A few days ago, there was one um, uh, community case and they actually posted 
where this person went so that if other people had gone to those places they can uh, watch and see if they get sick so this is how singapore manages the community in the lab so far i have not heard of any lab acquired uh, infection there have been some healthcare workers who have been infected they do their best they follow the risk assessment and they do all this but simply by the volume of work it, there is always a possibility that something can go wrong even if you have taken care mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you dr vg it was a very direct answer again contact tracing and uh, that is the last question we're going to ask uh, the rest of the questions we are we apologize for not mentioning them but we will be posting the answers of your questions uh, through the BRAP link. Again, we would like to thank the uh, resource person who answered our questions. And we'll now proceed to synthesis. In her lecture, Maureen showed us the WHO guidance for biosafety and biosecurity for COVID-19, and then the local guidance for IITM following risk-based approach. She pointed out that the new WHO guidance on the performance of POC that it could perform on a bench without employing a biosafety cabinet when the local risk assessment so dictates following the con conditions are fully met. Risk assessment, wearing of appropriate PPE, well-trained in GMPP, and validated infectious waste process, including excess specimen. She also discussed GMP and the steps that could cause aerosolization. She also discussed importance of using biosafety cabinet, disinfection, decontamination, and emergency procedures. The importance of training, demonstration of competency, and the impact of IFBA professional certification. Finally, Maureen underscored the value of being critical thinkers and focusing on applying the knowledge to solutions that are risk-based, practical, and sustainable over long period. And she also admonished us to contribute our expertise, our experiences, our knowledge to our colleagues and provide support and input to national authorities in policy deployment. As for the lecture of Dr. Vigi, she discussed the risk assessment process in identifying highly infectious characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 virus. She, her, her lecture helped us, the laboratorians, in assessment of risk and application of work restrictions with potential exposure to the virus. The information identified by this process provides a clear guide for the selection of appropriate laboratory biological safety levels in order to minimize the risk of exposure. This lecture enabled the participants, capabilities, and confidence for conducting biological risk assessment and inculcate the importance of biological risk assessment for sound biological risk management. She showed us the matrix of how to do risk assessment, and hopefully everyone got it. She showed us that training is a must for all of us working in the laboratory. And this is an instruction how to claim your e-certificates. You need to answer the webinar post evaluation and post test using the links to be flashed in the succeeding slide. Kindly double check your email address and full name before submitting your post test. You also need to get a score of at least 60% in the post test in order to, for you to receive an e-certificate in a single attempt. The e-certificate will be sent to your registered email, and that's the reason why you need to double check your email address. And the link will only be open again for the next 30 minutes. We would like to thank our participants who joined us tonight and for being enthusiastic with your continuing education even in this time of pandemic. Of course, we are grateful for the essential information shared by our two equally important resource persons, 
and personalities of biosafety and biosecurity. Also, we will not forget to mention the significant contributions of people behind the scene. Professor Oliver Shane Dumawal, who is in charge of the technical control panel and post webinar activities. The Dr. Lila Florento, who is currently halfway across the globe, but is significantly connected just to make this webinar possible. Finally, to the two pillars of their respective association, Dr. Martin Moreno and Mr. Ronnie Puno, we can't thank you enough for your unending vision of providing education and information to your membership wherever they are. This has been Larry, and together with BRAP, we say stay safe, stay biosafe. Good night, everyone, and good luck on your post-test.